Well, thank you and uh, welcome to manure sampling in North Carolina. Um, just as a footnote, uh, we, North Carolina does have a significant number of poultry um, as well as swine. Uh, our pigs get all the news attention, unfortunately, but uh, we do have poultry in the state, so I thought I'd just take a minute to acknowledge that and share a little bit about uh, the variability in, in poultry litter, both, both across species or, uh, or, or types of uh, birds, but also the location in the house is important where you're sampling from. So uh, if you're gonna be sampling uh, before a clean out, it's important to uh, sample what you're going, going to be removing. So for a complete clean out, we'd wanna take a cross section of the barn and as well as a depth profile to get a representative sample of that material. If, uh, if you're gonna be sampling after clean out, um, it would be very similar to the solid manure sampling that uh, stockpiles that Aaron spoke about earlier, so I won't go into uh, detail uh, there. Uh, I will point out that uh, uh, University of uh, Kentucky does have a good uh, fact sheet on manure sampling as well, and I'd encourage you to take a look at that for more information. Uh, really, my presentation was billed as uh, talking about lagoon sampling, and so that's what I want to really focus on this afternoon with the rest of my time. Um, we sample lagoons primarily to uh, maintain lagoon performance, but also to meet our permit requirements for permitted facilities in North Carolina, which essentially is all swine operations or anyone with more than 200 uh, head of pigs. So. And then, we, and then we would sample that for uh, nutrient content, content for the nutrient management plan, but then also the, to maintain the required sludge surveys uh, that are required as part of the permit. We do allow, the permit does allow for a 60-day sampling window, so you've got a uh, essentially 120 day that you can sample either uh, pre or post uh, application. We, uh, it, it, it does state in the permit that it, uh, uh, all, all efforts should be made to get that, to do that sampling prior to the land application, but understand that that's not always possible. And then each facility is also required to have a, uh, a sludge survey conducted annually as part of that, uh, per, part of the permit requirements. Uh, Carl talked a little bit about the difference between a holding pond and a lagoon. And I'll just expand on that a little bit uh, to emphasize that here, our interest is primarily in the annual application for, for the wastewater. Uh, we have to maintain that treatment volume. Uh, but you'll notice on this diagram that we do allow the producers, for producers to go six inches into that permanent treatment volume in preparation of a hurricane. So by late August, we encourage them actually to have that pump down to where we can have, they can have 30, 30 to 40 inches of additional rainfall storage in the lagoons prior to hurricane season. But then we also are trying to manage that uh, uh, long-term sludge storage in the bottom of the lagoon so that it's not increasing, encroaching on that treatment zone as well. Um, just an example of the samplers the, that we've used here for, for liquid samples. Uh, this particular one is a, we call it a discrete liquid sampler. It was actually designed for some microbial sampling um, where you can take the, lower that to a predetermined depth in the lagoon and collect a discrete sample at that depth. And it works pretty well in a lagoon, works all the way to the bottom of the lagoon um, or at least within a foot of the bottom, and we don't encourage uh, during sludge removal. We we encourage folks to stay at least two feet off the bottom just to uh, protect the integrity of the lagoon liner. Um, we do use the sludge judge at times. That um, it has some advantages. You can actually collect a uh, sample of both the top water and as well as the sludge, but it can also give you a visual. Uh, measure of the where the sludge 
zone starts. And so we can use that as, as part of a, one method for our sludge surveys as well. Um, as Carl said, uh, we don't like to go on lagoons um, unless we have to, but unfortunately for sludge sampling, there's really not a uh, effective uh, main means of doing it without getting on the lagoon. Um, safety is always a concern, and this the fellow here standing up, postdoc. You know, you can't tell them anything. Uh, didn't have his his uh, life jacket on, but we always encourage folks to wear a life jacket as well as work in teams. So we uh, generally say two people on the on the pond as a third observer on shore in case there is a uh, an accident. Um, sampling that's appropriate for the uh, what's the activity that's going to be taking place and here thinking primarily about sludge removal. Uh, we, we have two different methods primarily that uh, producers are using, either irrigating the whole lagoon and, and pumping and hauling that or dewatering the liquid first and then uh, dredging the sludge out. So we can do that both of the, either method uh, if we're going to do the total uh, agitation, we just take the sludge judge, sample the whole water column, do that in a minimum of uh, uh, eight locations around the lagoon, composite those, and then submit a subsample for analysis. If we're going to dewater the lagoon first, then we would take the sludge judge or other sampling device and just measure that bottom part of the lagoon that's going to be uh, removed as a second, second step of the operation. The uh, talk a little bit about the sludge surveys because that's getting a lot of our lagoons are getting to the point that uh, sludge management is becoming an issue. We have looked at several methods of how to measure that level of sludge um, and both high tech and low tech. Uh, we started out really you know, the disc on a rope and the uh, bucket lid on a pole, but have since moved to more reliable and repeatable methods. Um, but unfortunately, here again, for the initial survey, we have to find the bottom of the lagoon and the, uh, the tried and true method and only reliable method that I have found is the PVC pole calibrated and doing that from the surface of, of the lagoon. Also done some looking at a, a weighted disc to determine the uh, really that top of the really dense sludge that we really want to be managing rather than the top of the biologically active zone of the of the lagoon. So the, the sludge gun is, is an infrared device. It's just there's a sensor on that head that's lowered down. When the solids concentration or the color of the liquid uh, is thick enough to break that beam, it sends a signal up and you get a, an uh, indication of the density of that material by the tone um, of the an audible signal and then you just take a reading off of the cable. Uh, that was really the, has been the gold standard for sludge management in municipal systems, activated sludge plants uh, for years, and it works well in the treatment lagoons also. But we've also looked with, at uh, sonar devices or a fish finder, and they in, in general agree well with the sludge gun, and these are finding that top of the biologically active zone of the uh, of the sludge and and in typical in our lagoons that's there's that we call it the fluffy layer of bi biologic uh, treatment blanket it's 18 to 24 inches is typical um, in this picture you can just see that 8.6 is to the top of that black line the that white zone in between there is actually a, a measure of the thickness of the sludge and with low levels of sludge you can that works when you get much over two to three feet of sludge, that sound signal has a hard time uh, penetrating that and getting reflected back to the sensor. So it's, it's reliable for the top of the sludge, not so much for the bottom of the sludge. We've had a lot of iterations of boats built by the extension agents. Uh, one of the integrator companies has built their own boats and, um, and these are equipped with a both GPS and the sonar recording capabilities which gives us the opportunity to map not only where the boat has uh, traversed the lagoon, but also when you add in the sludge depth to sludge, you can start generating 
maps of uh, 3D maps of where the sludge is located, which then can serve to direct where you're going to be uh, need to be concentrating your sludge removal or your sludge sampling. And all this, like I say, is GPS uh, located, so you could essentially program a that location into the to a dredge and go back to the you know, important locations. We all, there are some castable devices now that work equally as well, looking at different ways to uh, deploy those rather than casting from shore, uh, maybe flying those with a drone. Um, I've done some preliminary work with that, but I haven't actually sampled a lagoon yet. So, but my wife's told me once I do that, I can't bring it back to the house for further testing. So I've got to get my, uh, get all my preliminary testing done first. Um, just real quickly, uh, with we in the process of covering uh, lagoons in North Carolina for both methane capture, odor reductions, and so looking at a, the looking at that sonar method to see if that can reliably uh, do the survey through that cover. Because with the cover, there's a, generally a limited number of access ports to the lagoon liquid, and uh, so I've done some comparison between pre and post covers. This is a uh, samples collected uh, or surveys done about a year apart with uh, pre and post cover. And in general, the numbers agree. That one uh, negative number was due to the uh, producer actually cleaning out sludge before, uh, before he installed the cover, which is an advisable thing. Um, here's just looking at uh, the repeatability. I did three surveys on this one lagoon on the same day. And you could, but so you can, this was over 12 survey points. So you can see the variability between a point to point variability, but the average for the survey is relatively close within two tenths of a foot uh, variation across those three surveys, which is certainly acceptable for our uh, intent and purposes. Also then looking at the, uh, trying to look at the effect of the cover itself. And so I took a reading uh, without the cover through one of th through those uh, three access ports and then went right adjacent to that with a sonar device placed on the surface of the cover and took that second reading and here again those uh, uh, numbers uh, agree relatively well and so I'm pleased with the the way that functions with the with the cover and that's the we've accepted that uh, as a as a method for the covered lagoons. Um, and this just shows you some of the variability over time on, uh, this is two different lagoons, I won't go into the treatment and untreated, but just showing you the, actually, the latter part, to the right-hand side, those were monthly sampling. So we get a lot of variability. So depending on why you're doing the survey, if that number's critical, it's important to take multiple surveys uh, over time and then look at the trends rather than the uh, actual day uh, single sample point. Um, we do have a fact sheet on sludge survey methods. I encourage you to take a look at that if you want more information. And we are uh, updating that as well. 